Good evening um, and welcome to the Clark Road Barn Advisory Committee. Um, this is meeting number three for those of you who are keeping track. Um, we uh, have um, representatives from the committee here. I know there were a few folks that indicated they were going to have a conflict with tonight's meeting. And we do have one of our committee members who is participating remotely. Uh, Sri is with, joining us via Zoom um, and is listening in, and uh, but with video off uh, because I believe she's doing this from her office so that she can continue uh, an unforeseen work scheduled item. Um, tonight we're gonna start off by uh, picking up or resuming our conversation related to the, um, the scoring rubric. Based on last month's meeting, lots of discussion and some recommendations for changes and additions. So I thought we could start there by picking up where we left off. So I'm gonna move um, the, and there's this um, revised version, um, and I've created a new name for it so we sort of can keep track and monitor changes over time. Um, because we all can't see very well, I'm going to sort of zoom in and scroll over. Um, forgive me. Oh, how to, hmm. Okay, well, there's a skill I wasn't expecting to have to use. Uh, hold on one second. Um. Um, if it's helpful, I am watching the live feed on Facebook as well, so I can see what you're sharing through that, just in case it saves you time. Okay. Oh, okay. Brian, is that, that's going to be okay then, correct? Okay. Um, you know what we can do? <laughs> we're going to give it a shot, Sri. You can let me know if you can see what we're looking at. I can see the screen. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Okay. Here we are. I'm very impressed with my technical <laughs> skills right there. <laughs> Just going to note that for the record. Um, all right. So things that um, you'll note that um, facility facilities priority hasn't changed. That was something that was in the first go around. Historic preservation, there has been a change in the, the, the scoring and the rubric from one through five. And what I'm sharing with you tonight is based on what Caitlin Mavis provided to me. Um, and we can certainly talk about it. I had some thoughts about number three and four that I thought we could bring up. But so a low score, a score of one would say the structure is completely demolished. Um, from a historic preservation standpoint, a score of two would indicate that the structure is selectively demolished with a portion retained and stabilized or rehabilitated. Historic preservation uh, score of three, the st structure is fully retained and stabilized to await a full scale rehabilitation when the funds are available and or when the property is conveyed to a new owner with sufficient funds to undertake a complete rehabilitation. Four is structure is fully rehabilitated and adapted to a new use with some significant modifications and or loss of historic character defining features. Structure and a five would be the structure is fully rehabilitated and adapted to a new use utilizing the Secretary of Interior standards for rehabilitation with moderate or minimal loss of historic character defining uh, features. So I just want to maybe pause here and have folks respond or thoughts about this um, modification. And if you want, and I'm happy to call up the original that had more generic language that Matt and I made up <laughs> based on our, what we took a best guess at just to have a conversation starter. Any thoughts about this? Does this seem okay? The, the one thing that occurred to me is that Num a higher score was given to something where there's gonna be significant modifications or a loss of historic character. So I thought maybe three and four could be flipped. So, so initially, I, I had a, kind of a hard time wrapping my brain around this because I kind of initially had them, I had, I had them combined initially where I was kind of equating stabilization and rehab, like not prioritizing, not like 
putting weight on rehab versus stabilization. Okay. Um, so I kind of went back and forth on that, you know, because I think stabilization is a very, um, from a preservation professional perspective, it's a desirable outcome. But I do think the most desirable outcome from a preservation perspective is full rehabilitation, right? So, yeah, I mean, I think you could go either way with switching those. Yeah, I think it, yeah, I think it's really up to uh, maybe the committee to decide which would which do you think you would weigh more, more highly from a historic preservation standpoint. You know, because sure. I think from from a preservation professional standpoint, um, you could make either argument. Any thought? And I guess I'm looking at the um, the non town staff committee members for your thoughts and feedback. I think, uh, you know, I, again, this is something that I just, it, in when I, my first review of it, I was like, oh, that, you know, but now as I'm thinking about it, if you think of it from a score of one to five with three sort of landing almost in like neutral land, then maybe that is the most neutral. That it, is neutral, it, it's not. It seems almost like three and five should be flipped with each other, according like to how much it preserves the the history or something. Because it seems like the end goal of three it would be to, you know, fully rehabilitate or whatever uh, the property, whereas five is changing it a lot. So, so just I should clarify some terms. Okay. Actually, I, what I meant to do, Carrie, is I, I I think you know when you do get to the point of um, you know providing like guidance on sh on scoring I'd be happy to help like define terminology um, so just to remind folks when we talked we talked a little bit about stabilization at the last meeting and that as a concept is your kind of um, you're, you're halting future deterioration on a structure so it's not necessarily habitable or usable but basically you're buttoning up the building so that it doesn't deteriorate further beyond the point of repair so that usually involves you know, putting on a new roof or patching the roof um, and just making sure it's secure from the elements. Um, Isn't that the first step in rehabilitating it? It can be, yeah. I mean, especially if you have a very large scale rehabilitation you that's going to be f like taking place over several years or it's taking time to gather the finances for it. You know, your phase one and year one, maybe you are just stabilizing it to buy yourself more time. Stabilization is really just buying yourself more time if, say, you don't have, you know, your full financing in place. Um, and then, so a rehabilitation and also the term adaptive reuse, which I've kind of used interchangeably, that's really like the gold, unless you're restoring, restoring something like a museum, um, rehabilitation and adaptive reuse is really the gold standard in, in our preservation professional world, um, where that's really what we advocate as, as preservationists is rehabilitation, and that does account for um, reasonable modifications and alterations to um, historic features, where you're 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 being practical. You're trying to retain as much of the architectural features as possible, but changing, adapting, removing them as needed to make sure that the structure is functional for the present day. So I don't know if that helps kind of clarify what I'm getting at. Could I ask a question? So if we're thinking about four versus five, is there a difference in material selection? Is there a difference in, um, or are we still using the same materials? I'm like, I'm trying to think about how and where we would obtain like materials to replace what's on the current barn that would be consistent with its historic value and condition. Does that make sense? I'm, maybe I'm like blabbering on here no, with a question. No, I interject right there just for a second? Because yeah. you're sort of going to, maybe you're not, I don't understand Secretary of Interior Standards. Oh, yes, okay. thank you. Is that U.S. <laughs> Secretary? Thank you, yes. thank you. No, State? That's, I'm using a lot and of if jargon. We go there, if we go there, is there, are they mandatory? These are great questions. Thank you for asking. Um, I should definitely... I, sh I, sh I should have sent you these <laughs> definitions along with uh, these suggestions. So the Secretary of the Interior Standards, which in, in the field we just shorthand say the standards. Um, 
those are standards that are a set of 10 guidelines that are established by the National Park Service, um, which is the federal agency that administers preservation programs in the US. And they are, I always tell folks, they're kind of like the 10 commandments for preservation professionals and, and you know architects who work in preservation. Um, if you are doing something, if you're doing a, they're only mandatory if you're doing something like a, a rehab project that's util, utilizing federal historic tax credits, right? You wanna use the federal government's money, you gotta play by the federal government's rules. Um, but we still use them um, and apply them in, you know, anytime I'm evaluating a project, just like if someone wants my opinion or I'm commenting on any kind of project, I still, those are still like my 10 commandments in my head, right? Even though they're not required necessarily to be applied in any given project, um, but it's still what we as preservation professionals use um, to kind of guide our evaluation of projects and the treatment of historic buildings. Um, so does that answer your question? And I'll put the, I'm just pulling up the standards for rehabilitation from the US uh, Secretary of the Interior. Happy to share some of these either in a PDF or a document um, with the committee after the fact so that everybody can sort of educate themselves a little bit more and if Caitlin has any materials at the ready that maybe are more um, user friendly because sometimes I think in the, uh, forgive me if I'm about to insult any of my architect or designer friends, but sometimes the, um, the, you know, the language is very much for people who understand that and do that for a living. So absolutely, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, and the National Park Service has a lot of good guidance online, mm -hmm. um, but it, they are these ten guidelines are very open ended and up to interpretation. And you know, as I'm sure Sarah can vouch, you know, if any ten preservationists you could ask them their opinion on does this meet the stand does project meet the standards, you might get you know six different answers. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> they're they they're broad. Sure. Um, all right, so the, I guess for my question here then about the material selection is one, is number four, maybe there's a little bit more wiggle room then on material use to, to do the rehabilitation and maybe it, does, it misses a mark on the, from the interior standards. What would you, how would we distinguish between four and five if people were, is there a good way to You know, I, it's a hard, it's a tr it's a little bit. I think too. I, I understand what you're getting at because you want to make it as specific as possible for folks who you know don't don't, don't work in this every day, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, but it's you know be, be because the standards and every are so general. I mean, you, you know, I guess you, you one thing that we generally. Um, in terms of if you wanted to get specific about materials that almost never would be something that would be considered to meet the standards would be like the use of like vinyl siding or vinyl windows. Okay. But it's hard to it's hard to get specific because so much of it too is what's the cumulative effect of all the changes. Sure. Right. So I think about like, um, for example, roofing material. Can you replicate the roof material that was utilized? Was it changed at some point in the history of the barn? These are things that we probably don't may not may not know. Right now, we're off the. I don't even know. Do we know if the roof was changed? No idea. Right. So and and things know. like roofing material. Like I can tell you, just for that example, like things yep. like roofing materials aren't really important. Okay. It, okay. Unless it happened, unless you know, it, it it was like a tile roof or yeah, something it had that some made some ornate a, slate or tile roof, right. and even then, there's the most important things to have a roof. <laughs> <laughs> True. Yes. Um, all right. So, how anybody else have any thoughts or um, questions related to the historic preservation rubric scoring? With the understanding that I'll provide some more background information on the interior standards, the Secretary of the Interior standards. 
Um, do we know if there's anything specific? I know with, with National Park Service, which seems like a funny place for um, architectural standards and historic preservation land, but New York State mimics it because it's the New York State Office of Parks and Historic Preservation. So it's the same, anybody who's ever had to deal with SHPO, which is the shortened version of that, knows what, what that is as well. But does National Park Service have anything specific to barn? Do we know? I know that they have some like very specialized, like for villages or downtown city, like they have some very specific guidance for certain types of architecture. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I feel like I have used some resources resources before, but I could not name them. I, okay. They, so th yeah, I think they have a large collection of very, tech, uh, not very, but technical preservation briefs on different s subjects, um, you know, like restoring historic storefronts or, you know, repairing masonry. Yeah. And so I s want to say they have one on barns, but I okay. don't quote me on that. <laughs> um, well, maybe what we'll do is we'll take a look and we can see if we can find one. If we do, then we, that's certainly something we would share with this group. I think that would help sort of educate and inform all of us as we're contemplating mm -hmm. this. We didn't make any changes to the rubric <laughs> as it relates to the thresholds for initial upfront cost. Um, we didn't change anything related to the long-term operational costs, but we will chat about that a little bit in a little bit later. Um, we've got some information just to give some, you know, maybe a starting point of conversation. Um, the public um, and community use, this didn't change either. This is talking about whether or not from a, from a low score would be the public is not able to utilize the property at all, with a high score being the public will have highly um, frequent use of the property. Um, the, there was some language confusion from the prior version about like, return on investment, and so we tried to clarify that a little bit. So this is return on tax, tax dollars paid and slash public benefit. Um, and so I wanted to get your thoughts about this. This, I guess, is sort of a, for the amount of money that might need to be spent by the town, depending on whatever scenario we're looking at, either that's gonna be a high return for the public at large or not a large return to them. And I think this is going to be one of those um, scoring items that's very subjective. Do you know what I mean? For, for each each person who looks at it. Um, because what's a, what's your a high value, what's a high return on an investment? Depends on what you ask and what the topic is. Some people spend a lot of money on a fancy car and think that's the, a very good use of money and other people have the same car they were driving in high school and think that's a, they'd rather spend their money elsewhere. So um, we have in there the Shadow Pines master plan consistency. And we put some, um, this was something that was mentioned, but we decided to try to put some uh, scale to it. So. And again, this seems maybe a little bit arbitrary, but we like, so we started with zero. It supports none of the desired uses or proposed improvements of the master plan. A, a score of two is, it supports one of them, two, uh, you know, then two of them, three of them, or four or more gets the highest rating. And then we have supports, goals, and priorities in the town's comprehensive plan. Um, directly addresses zero, addresses one, two to three, four to five, six or more. Um, and the, the comprehensive plan that's in draft form now is what we were thinking about, not the one from 2010. I just, for, a, for, you know, for clarity, I think this committee is gonna be working and in the, while that is happening, the town board will likely be moving forward with the adoption of the 2023 plan. There are some edits that are going to be needed based on the July 5th public hearing. So that'll be something that the town board will direct staff as to what changes they want to make. <coughs> um, so we'll, we, the, this board, this this committee could use the, the uh, most current comp plan for consideration. Um, town maintenance demand was another category of scoring. So it's either a low score would be daily or ongoing maintenance is required, um, and then no maintenance is required. Then we have a town revenue uh, source, um, 
and then no revenue is generated as a low score, and then um, revenue exceeds operation and maintenance significantly. I think we need to talk about this one a little bit. I think we maybe if we want to come up with a percentage, I don't know if we want to quantify that. I think revenue ex exceeds you know, operation and maintenance costs slightly. What does that mean? Does it mean it covers it by $500? Does it mean it covers it by $5,000? Does it mean it's, and I, and I guess when we're gonna be looking at some information that Andrew provided about revenue from other town facilities, maybe that'll help us understand sort of where the, what a, a good threshold might be. Certainly, yeah. yeah. I think it's also based on, you know, with our current lodges, you know, square footage and what sort of events, you know, right now it's a lot of graduation parties, you know, family picnics and things like that, where we have the capacity for 99 people in our lodges. So um, our rates kind of express that, you know, you look around to other municipalities with their lodges and even in uh, county parks and things like that, it varies all the way from a $20 open pavilion to a couple thousand dollars where people are having weddings there. So uh, I think there is the opportunity for revenue, but obviously it would need to be a little bit more defined with, you know, if, if it's $2,000 per use, you know, what is the use? Is it gonna be weddings and what other expenses go along with that with maintenance? So it kind of ties it all together. Right. Um, and then uh, the last category we have is town of Penfield's programming or use of facility, meaning town staff and it's programming and services and, and the provision of services. So the town would never use the property under this alternative. And then it's rarely, it uses it sometimes, it uses it um, often and then very frequently. So that's sort of a standard like scale of, you know, from low to, to high. So with the changes that we made from the last meeting to now, is everybody feeling comfortable with this? Do we see categories that we've missed for scoring um, alternatives? And we, um, I guess this is, even though it's, we, um, we didn't talk about the alternatives, but we finalized them together at the last meeting. Um, so this is the last sort of set that we had of potential alternatives to consider. And ultimately we'll be using, and I'm just gonna hopefully, I don't even know if I've updated the score sheet just to show you what that might look like. So, and again, I know this is like challenging everybody's eyesight because of the scale of it um, and I'm showing up on the TV, but this is, you know, here are the alternatives and here are the categories. And you'll note that I didn't make any presumptions. I left some open-ended columns here in case we added any new. But this sort of represents what we currently have as categories of for ranking and then the alternatives. Um, again, we can always continue to refine this if we need to. Um, so are, are these updates and these documents in that folder? I'll add them. I wanted to wait until we reviewed tonight before I upload, uploaded them. Um, and you'll forgive me, I knew that we were working on these, this document between last meeting and tonight, so I didn't upload them in the meantime because they were gonna be changed in a matter of a couple of weeks. But um, I'll put them into the, um, into the Google Drive for the committee um, at tomorrow. And certainly, um, I think I'm gonna say this as a, a general rule, and this is not only to my fellow colleagues, but to my fellow um, uh, committee members, that if I say I'm gonna put something in the drive and you go to look in the drive and you don't see it, do not be shy about telling me that. That just means I got tied up with other things and it fell off my to-do list. Um, so I won't, I won't be offended if you give me a little ping to remind me to, to put something in, in the drive. So are we feeling pretty comfortable about where we are right here for this rubric for now? Um, if anybody, you know, thinks about something, you know, three o'clock in the morning, you wake up with an idea, you know, don't be shy. You can share it with us and we can always talk about it um, uh, at a, uh, a future meeting and, and make changes as needed. I think my thought, and maybe we can talk about this, is that, you know, we've set up this rubric and the alternatives. I'm anticipating we're not gonna be ready to utilize that score sheet for a little bit of time because there's gonna be some data information, information gathering that we need to do. 
some continued conversations about sort of what things might look like, what potential uses. So I think we have to really wait until we get to that point. So even though we've done that rubric and we've got the alternatives, it's gonna take some more time to get to a point where we get to use it. Um, so I wanted to pull up, um, bear with me for a second. I don't know if this is it. I'm trying to remember what my, yeah, okay. So one of the requests we had for new information or for in, other information was sort of a, provide us with some context, right? As we're, as this committee is thinking about what to do with the Clark Road barn and evaluating some alternatives, what are some other town facility needs that are happening simultaneously or anticipated in the future? So. Um, Based on information that's been shared by our finance director, um, our DPW um, director, and the um, director of planning engineering, these are some of the bigger projects that have been either are underway or have been identified as a future need. Um, and the cost estimate has been provided, it's, it's very much plan, I'm gonna scroll to the very bottom first to focus on these. These are planning level cost estimates that are subject to change. Obviously inflation, cost of living, labor material costs. I think every, every one of us can sort of attest to, you know, three years ago you could do, you know, a new kitchen in your house for X amount of dollars and then that number has increased. I'm not even gonna put a number value on it, I'm just gonna say it's gone up in, in a noticeable way. So when we talk about these estimates, the one for the current project underway for DPW, that's, that's a pretty solid number just because it's based on current information available that's being used. Um, so there's Department of Public Works new facility. Um, that's gonna be um, a, an estimated to total cost of about 25 million. Five million dollars would be of, I say cash, no one's showing up with a, you know, a, a duffel bag full of money, it's general fund balance uh, that would be, uh, you know, set aside, and then a $20 million bond. Future major facility project needs, and this is not including regular maintenance and repair of roads, uh, underground infrastructure, sanitary and storm, um, lighting, uh, lighting, actually lighting is, there's a lighting update that's happening right now that's being part of, funded mostly through, um, through ARPA, but there is uh, a local lighting district that's using, our, L, our street lights are being updated to LED. So that's been a, that's a big undertaking that's happening right now. I'm trying to think of other sort of everyday costs that, you know, are gonna continue to be incurred. You know, equipment upgrades, these are, other facilities, and I, we might be even forgetting like um, regular maintenance um, and upkeep of the existing other structures that we have, like what building needs a new roof. Ba bathrooms, you know, just bathrooms. Out here at Columbus Crossing. You yes. know, LaSalle's has been mentioned and talked about other, other park locations where right. some more facilities could be added. Right, so we got the DPW, then other identified future needs would be a recreation facility, um, meaning a standalone recreation center, if you will. Um, town hall renovations, um, there's been some you know, pr preliminary review of current space and how it could be reconfigured with and without um, additions potentially, excuse me. So, um, and then there's would be also the library and PCC and that's the Penfield Community Center. That's the building that's located on Baird Road. It currently houses the library, recreation department, and uh, the courts. Um, if the recreation center were to be constructed, then that building could be reconfigured um, and space could be reallocated to share to the two uses that would be left. Um, so total other major future facility needs might be somewhere in the order of $40 million or more. So we share this information just so that it's, you know, the Clark Road barn is not, you know, happening in isolation. It's happening as part of other needs. And so it's always good to have that sort of framework. Um, and the other thing I wanted to, I 
share and maybe um, Tim, this is, uh, bear with me for a moment. <coughs> I know you provided it and I have it somewhere. Oh. If only I name things the way I. Hmm. Okay. Oh, wait, maybe it's up here. And forgive me, I'm sorry for those, everybody, anybody watching at home, this is painful television. So Tim, I'm looking to see mm -hmm. what you sent and I, I know I saved it. Um, maybe I, I might have saved it. So I can, I can get started. Yeah, I totally So um, what I was tasked was to break down basically the labor costs of what, w what it would take to maintain the uh, barn. And I, and I picked the most extreme thing as turning into a lodge, like an everyday use type deal. Um, these are just numbers that, we, that I picked out for an everyday use. So if we ever scale back to like a farmer's market, a seasonal type deal, um, we just cut out certain numbers like that. Um, this is based off of like an average hourly wage from the facilities and parks department. Um, and just running down some, uh, just some figures. Uh, our mowing company, we average about 27 cuts a year, so that's included in that. And then snow removal, because I'm assuming there's going to be a parking lot and we got to get the pathways ready. Um, on average, there's about 20 to 25 snow events a year. Um, and if we get into like daily cleaning, it's usually about one hour for um, Harris Whalen Lodge. So I took an overhead square footage. It mostly resembles Harris Whalen Lodge as far as square footage wise. Um, so I'm going off of that. Um, and that's 365 days a year. They clean it every day if it's used as a lodge. Even if it's not rented that day, they go in there, check things out, make sure that everything's in order, pipes aren't running, that kind of thing. Um, and then they do like a weekly cleaning, which is another four hours per week for like a deep clean, uh, other uh, stuff like that, sweeping the floors of it, like more vigorously, vigorously um, cleaning the bathrooms, that kind of thing. Uh, daily or building maintenance month, monthly. That uh, I was talking to my our facility crew about that. On average, they do about 12 hours per month, and that's like light bulbs, light bulbs, HVAC systems, that kind of thing. Just anything that pops up, fixing the stoves, um, and then yearly maintenance is up to like 20 to 30 hours per year. That includes like planing, painting, stripping, and cleaning the floors. Um, and that general type of thing where you would need extra time to do that where more heavily maintenance. Um, and then on my end of things, it goes back to the snow removal, um, mowing, uh, garden, because there's always a garden, there's always landscaping to be done around places like that. Um, so it's just general numbers. I don't know if you want me to actually get into it or? Well, I think, you know, this is sort of trying to give like a order of magnitude that information. And I think what might be helpful is at some point we might take a look at the alternatives and figure out mm -hmm. of the alternatives, which ones would require new staff. And yes. then like you, we could provide that information so that people... Okay understand you know what yes. the implication is Bet if between talking to our facility staff right now and my park staff um, if this was just a standalone extra project we could absorb it in-house but since we are adding more bathrooms on Columbus Crossing uh, raw office is being made year-round bathrooms um, if anything happens with the north 40 of Shadow Pines that type of deal we would right. probably have to accrue an extra staff member for that okay all right so that's good information to have and I just wanted to you know wanted to make sure that the you know we're all on the same page with respect to what um, the you the various uses of the building mean from an operation and maintenance standpoint yeah. because that again isn't happening in a bubble when you build it or re rehab it in this case um, it will potentially impact um, operation and maintenance costs, not just it, not in not in a finite way, and that's something that has to be yeah. factored in over time. Yeah, if it's like a lodge, it's going to be cleaned daily, which ends up being, my, if my numbers are semi-correct, it's about 
uh, $14,000 a year to clean it daily. Okay. Um, and then if it goes like just on the weekends, a farmer's market, you know, 27 weeks out of the year, that's just a different number. So it just goes down from there depending on what alternative um, is chosen. Okay. So, and I found it. I'm sorry, perfect. just now. <laughs> Out of curiosity, just, just did you use this as your sort of the worst case? It may not be worst case or the, worst or best, most, whichever most, way you see it. How about the most uh, costly? Yes. Uh, so what's that total number for the year? Total number for the year, I have it around 25000 and that's just maintenance. That's not materials. That's not. Right, that's um, all the things you talk about cleaning. Yep. Yep. Landscape. Yeah, that's not the toilet paper. That's not the mops. That's not the cleaning supplies. That's just labor cost. Well, and I think the other thing, too, that, and this becomes a little bit of a tricky situation because it's also not factoring in if there's new recreation staff needed to over provide services or other departments that might use it. So I think that's where we have to maybe come up with some information that might be, you know, helpful when it's, you know, we're and maybe it's not necessarily breaking it down based on what's happening. Maybe it's more of a, if it's used daily, this is what the potential implication might be from a town perspective if it's used, you know, you know, and some other, maybe there's other, some sliding scale that we can come up with that helps people get a frame, a sense of like impact, if you will. And I don't mean to get into the extreme details at this point, and as I recognize it's an idea, but just going to the staffing issue, I think the way you looked at your numbers, you included labor costs. Yes, okay. that is so, for this year. Right, but I mean, that's, so you said you could absorb it with the current staff if, no, if we don't do any other hiring. Mm -hmm. So this this does include labor expenses. So the point being is you don't need those. If, you, if we did this today, you, the labor in component of whatever you just gave us goes away. Correct. Okay. I think, I mean, I'm, I'm if they I, can, would, yes. I would anticipate we're going to have to hire people. Right. But I'm just, so I'm just trying to make clarity yeah. that this is, that's just work. Includes existing labor, even though you said you could absorb it with the staff you have today. Yes. Right. And that's, yes. I don't want to go any deeper than that. Just. Yep. No, no. And, and that's and that's just that's just perfect world if right. this was the only project we had going on. Right. And I think maybe it's helpful to know if there's a tipping point, like from from facilities and maintenance mm -hmm. standpoint, like if we get, you know, if this ha if the Clark Barn project comes up, you know, if there's two more facilities that come online, right. then then maybe that's the tipping point. And again, just... No, no, understood. So, because you said it didn't include necessarily materials or, you know, processing materials, then most of this $25,000 is labor. Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. Right. right. And that's either labor through staff employees or through contract. Yes. Correct? Yes, through okay. contract, yes. Right, right. Um, but, but that still seems a reasonable way to look at it, even no, though, no, no. yeah. Oh, yeah, I, I was just trying to, so when we make that impact about, well, now that we make decisions, you're going to come back and say, well, we, now's the time we're going to have to hire. Correct. People. This this already includes that labor component. Right. Kind of thing, that's all I was trying to go for. All right, and I'm sorry that I was late to the, um, and, and I'll, um, I'll share this. Um, and again, this is again very much of a planning level snapshot. This isn't, you know, no one should try to come to us with at the end of the year with the auditors to say, oh no, this wasn't exactly right. This is, um, you know, based on similar, you know, facilities. Um, excellent. Um, the the one other thing I wanted to to share with respect to the barn data, and we did upload in the Google Drive the, um, we have the, we had that data of other barns in town. We organized it two ways. One was by year, mm -hmm. and the other one was by size, um, square footage. By what, by, by year, what? A uh, year of construction. Okay. So, and I, I'm gonna, I can pull that up actually. Um, so, so for example, 
This is by year. Um, it's got the address, owner, and this is provided by the town assessor. Um, and just you'll know, when you see these really solid even numbers and lots of them, that is somebody's best guess and it might be somewhere in the 1840s, but not, it might not be exactly 1840. It might be 1842, 1843. Um, so just to keep that in mind, I don't know that they were keeping super strict records or, or that translated to today's assessment data. Um, but I think this is somebody's best guess based on information they had. So this is in the drive and you can see, um, and we did end the, the time period um, I think if memory serves me in 1950, thinking anything beyond that wouldn't be similar in terms of style of construction, things like that. Although you probably, you might be able to find, but we figured we have to cut the, cut it off at some point so that you weren't ca capturing modern day pole barns. The other way that we uh, pulled that data was by a uh, size sorting. And so you'll see some really small, adorable barns and then you'll see them, you know, get larger and larger. And so then, the question I had, we had, well, I'm sorry. Three square feet. That's, yes. That's a birdhouse. Well, <laughs> and it's possible the data. I mean, we might have to go take a little drive by to make sure that somebody didn't, that that's not a data entry issue, <laughs> which it very well could be that no one ever caught over time. That happens. Um, so you'll see, you know, the 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 size of barn. Now the question we had as staff is when we're comparing inventory, should we maybe even bring this list into a more manageable size and say, okay, we're gonna do, we're gonna keep the year from the beginning of time to 1950, but we're gonna only look at barns that are 1,000 feet to 4,000 feet or 1,000 feet to 5,000 feet so that there's some you know comparable scale and we're not looking at a, a birdhouse, if you will, Bob. So what are your thoughts about size comparison, is, if that's helpful or not? Or it doesn't matter from a historic preservation standpoint. I'll chime in. Okay. Um, not to, I, I think the usefulness of a document like this is somewhat limited without um, more uh, without uh, visual architectural analysis. Okay. Um, so for example, what we often encourage communities to do with any property type, or you can focus on specific thematic property types like barns, is to do what we call a historic resources inventory. And that kind of study is really what allows you to, um, um, to be able to assess what you have in your community. So for example, like right now, we are doing an inventory of all of the barns in the town of Victor. So they'll, they, because their planning commission was getting applications for demolition and they want to know, well, what do we have? When people come to us with an application for demolition, we want to know, is this, you know, the only barn of its type in the town of Victor type of thing? So that is, you know, without having some kind of architectural analysis of like, you know, that barn built in 1924 on Penfield Road is, you know, a, rare example of a, you know, 20th century dairy barn, you know, type of like, or this is a rare example of a 19th century, you know, Yankee barn, bank barn, whatever. I think this information is somewhat, it's good to have, but it's somewhat limited. Okay. I guess is what no, I that, and that's, that's fair. I think um, we'd have to figure out what our steps could be. I don't know that we have the capability of doing an, an, an architectural No, I mean, that would inventory. be a significant, that's, that's a project. Yeah, yeah right, right. <laughs> So I'm not um, suggesting that, you know, yeah. you should go out tomorrow and do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I, you know, we can, give some th we can certainly think about, I know that that's one of the issues is in terms of like, and somebody, I, I don't know who said it, but sort of trying to understand sort of like the implication, is this the last of this barn's kind in the town of Penfield or in Monroe County or in our you know Finger Lakes region? Because then that would be a big, that's a big deal. If there's multiple examples of this style of, or architectural construction, 
do you have, is there like someone in the community, like the town historian or someone in the community? I'm going to find out. I mean, that's a thought I was having as we were chatting. So I was going to find out if there's anyone. You know, because there's often folks in any given community that just that knowledge kind of resides in their head. Right. Um, yeah, also going to maybe think about whether or not I might reach out to some of the folks in the agricultural community that might have that information as well. So we'll we'll start to knock on a few doors, if you will, or send a few emails because it's now current day. So I think we can certainly look into that a little bit further and see what information we can gather. But the information's out there. If it's something that's of interest to you, or you know, certainly we'll have it. And then, but that's a fair point, and I appreciate you raising it, Caitlin. It's information, but it's not, you know, it's not everything we would need to know. So I think in the uh, historical conversation that was driving this, there was a question about have other communities within our region done something with an old barn as a model of how they approached that? Did we yeah. ever figure that out? We haven't figured that out yet. That's on our list of yeah. information to gather. Right. Um, so we'll be, we were going to be checking in with a few folks from neighboring communities that we know have had similar um, experiences or something to that effect. Um, we can add Victor to our list <laughs> because we, we were not aware of that. But um, okay. we'll try to share back more information related to that um, at, a, at a future meeting. Um, I wanted to ask if, um, so that was the barn data follow up. I did want to ask if everybody received the email with Mike Heath's flyover imagery, if everybody had a chance, got the email with Mike Heath's um, drone imagery. We thank him for that. That was a helpful addition. It has been loaded into the drive. It, and if anybody is having issues or difficulties getting to that data, please let me know. I'm happy to walk you through it. Um, so we're at a point where what other information, and I'm going to go back to my um, Excel sheet because this was, we had the, sort of the running information needed. Um, so we're still working on the historic significance and rarity piece. That's going to be something we need to gather a little bit more information about. We've started the operation and maintenance costs. Um, we've got the other town facilities projects and estimated costs. Um, we've got to figure out a way and what our method might be. Um, planning level cost estimates for construction. I don't know how we're going to get there without I, I'm not sure. We have to. Th I'm trying to be creative. Um, I certainly will have a c conversation with Candace and with Bob um, because those, you know, cost estimating isn't free um, from uh, engineers and architects. So I don't know if there's sort of like a rule of thumb. Like I'm trying to think in, you know, in my in my past life um, in the private sector, you. You could look and say, oh, there's a mile of, you know, uh, overhead wire, and we know that the linear, the average linear cost per square foot was X amount. So if somebody wanted to, your mile of burying those overhead wires is going to be 1.5 million, you could just know that just based on linear footage and like accepted average costs for those kind of things. Is there such a thing? And I probably not because historic preservation is so, there's such a wide spectrum, but do we think there's places we could find? I mean, yeah, I think for a barn it's difficult. Like if it was, um, you know, a, a downtown commercial building, right, you could say the price per square foot is average, whatever, you sure. know, but for something like this, I think it might be more, more challenging. tricky. Yeah. Okay. So. I thought there was, uh, in the past, there was a program uh, sponsored by the state for the preservation of barns, and they they uh, awarded grant money based on uh, applications. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know that uh, municipalities are an eligible recipient. I think they're typically. I was just wondering whether or not a barn in this town had received a grant money, oh. or if there was a, a barns in Western New York, if they'd received grant money, what was the order of magnitude for the grant in order to restore the barn? Oh, all right. That's an interesting uh, thought. I can certainly reach out. It would be. It would have been Shippo. Typically, that would have. So at least as long as I've been at Landmark Society, which is 13 years, there the the there used to be a grant program through the New York State Barn Alliance. But at least as long as I've been here, that's 
been defunct. I thought in the last couple of years they came out with another I, program. I thought they had to. But they were like really specific okay. parameters yeah, I'm not. for like what the use will be, how you like rehabilitate it. I mean, there is the so. barn tax credit. Yeah. Yep. Um, but I'm not familiar with any grant for construction specifically. But, but even if there was money, uh, information for 10 years ago, you could. Could you, you could, could you extrapolate it, it to today's? More now, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> try to do the uh, the per year cost inflator um, to see if you can get to a more current number. Um, well, Sarah, I might pick your brain after the fact and see if we can f track down that is it the funding source because I don't mind we can among staff here can um, and look at me, <laughs> Matt, our junior planner, <laughs> um, can uh, we can certainly. Um, see what resources, and, and also Shannon Barg, who's not here, is our Historic Preservation Commission liaison, so she may have some insight and or contacts to reach out to as well, so we can try to work on that. I think that's, this is a, a sort of a big number, item number four, this planning level cost estimates for construction is gonna be a tricky one, and we wanna get somewhere that, you know, um, that gets us an idea of like, how much are we talking? Um, and then I think town revenue estimates based on existing town programming, that's something that um, if for our next meeting, I'm gonna have Andrew sort of provide some, you know, sort of here's some context, you know, based on Dolomite, based on Harris Whalen, you know, this is what the revenue looks like based on this kind of program and, and these kind of uses. Just because I think that helps us understand Oh, do you have it now? Yeah, if you want. You want to? Oh, all right. Let's just uh, just general. This is um, so. This has nothing to do with programming. This just has to do with what our rental numbers were from 2021, 22, and 23. Okay. For like, if if Tim indicated that Harris Willen would be a similar sort of a thing. So, um, you know, I won't get to all the numbers, but it's roughly between 20 and 24 thousand that we bring in just in revenue. Um, for the lodges, uh, for Harris Whalen. Uh, Dolomite's a little bit more, it's a little bit more costly to rent the Dolomite. I think it's about $50 more than Harris Whalen compared to a resident and non-resident price. Um, if we were looking at Dolomite, that one is between 30 and 35,000. So um, again, back to Harris Whalen, between 20 and 24,000 of what we bring annually in for revenue for renting that. Okay, very good. We also do use Harris Whalen and Dolomite for recreation programs, so there are other revenues that are brought in for, for us to use it. Like over the summer, um, you know, noticing that the the recreation center was listed as a you know uh, potential for future projects and things like that. You know, we're always looking for a facility space at the recreation department to have more programs. Unfortunately, we have to cancel a lot. Uh, of new people trying to come in because we're trying to find space, but and ever since COVID, we've really utilized Dolomite and Harris Whalen for dance programs over the summer. Um, we have all of our daytime education at recreation programs there, typically between Monday and Friday, just because that's when the heavy use for graduation parties we're not seeing it then. So we'd rather have the space used for rec programs, gathering revenue. I'm I don't know if I'll be able to get any specific you know, revenue based on what rec programming is um, in those buildings, I can certainly try to provide that. Um, but ultimately, kind of going back to what I said before, it would really just be based on what the use would be. If it's got a dance floor, great, we'll use it for dance. If it's got a general floor, I mean, we can put any programming in there, but it'd be hard to define how much revenue we would get off just this location. I right. can certainly try by all means from the recreation side of things, but um, in terms of the facility rental, I can pull that up obviously pretty easy. Okay, very good. At the risk of getting into those details again. So um, the, the, the pricing that you have for the, the rental, do you set that price based on trying to cover your operating expenses per year, or is it based on a community Standard board. kind of thing, what people yep. are sort of what you think the community is willing to pay, and you're not worried about necessarily covering so, all your operating costs. So, within the last couple of years, we've really tried to define 
um, based on what other communities have for their lodges, with their pricing. Certainly, obviously, we also look at you know what are you know the numbers that Tim brought in. Um, I wouldn't say that's the defining piece to say oh we got to make sure that we make more. Uh, if anything, I think we try to be as reasonable as possible when we're looking at yeah, that. So you're so, just trying to set a general market price. Yep. Because yes. The markets carrying and 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 thanks you to want it used. Yeah, <laughs> thanks to Carrie and a lot of other people. Um, that is being approved on an annual basis by town board for all of our fees. So we've come up with a nice fee structure. So obviously that could change from year to year based on any improvements that we bring in, like if we have Wi-Fi, if we have a new stove, you know, if we see the use going up in other places. But um, when we were looking at other places and what they were, like I said before, you know, there's places that are charging $2,000 a day for a wedding sort of a venue and things like that. So there's certainly the market for that. It would just be based on what we think is reasonable. And what the amenities are. Correct. Comparable amenities. Yeah. It's Sorry. in the future, is this going to go to the conversation about return on investment and how much revenue you're generating and why you're generating it? I don't know if that's been part of the town board's dialogue to date. I think generally it's about service to the town and wanting to make sure that the available resources are reachable um, for the community. That's been always a, that's really more of a town board decision after getting input. I, I haven't, I'm not sure that it's been, you know, looked at, and certainly this would be a question for them. Um, I'm not sure if they're weighing operation and maintenance costs as they're looking at the the per you know day charge. I'm just going to the Rubik's where we have yes. certain sure. issues in there that we'll right. start talking about. There's a firm in uh, Utica that specializes in uh, restoration of post and beam barns. Okay. And I'll try to get that name to you. All right, that'd be great. Thank you. They, they also are are known for uh, uh, taking them down to to for salvage, so they could use those parts for restoring others. Okay, that'd be good information to have. Thank you. And if anyone else has any other you know contacts or potential resources, again, this is a time not to be shy. Um, we appreciate any everybody's contributions. Um, so uh, we have some more information to start gathering. We're going to look to for the next meeting to try to ga gather some experiences or information from other places, preferably in New York State, because I think that's the most comparable. Um, because they would have to have adhered to any you know municipalities. So <laughs> we'll be looking for that to share that information. We'll try to track down some opportunities or resources for developing the planning level uh, cost estimates and certainly we'll be sharing um, the existing utility information I, we can certainly get that i i did ask um and i'm sorry I, I must have saved it safely on my computer at my desk and not on the network but um i did get a um like a facility the facilities uh, portion of the town's budget um for 2023 and then like spending to date sort of a thing so you can sort of see this is how much is allotted for rg and &E. this is how much is allotted for and that's for facility across the town not just for anyone you're not the first to do that and you will not be the last <laughs> <laughs> there are all kinds of wires floating around under here i've almost knocked televisions over before not paying attention um so we'll be gathering some more information to share out at the next meeting. Um, I think that uh, we're likely, and I, I do apologize, my availability is limited in August. Um, and so I'll, I'm gonna be out of town for a good chunk of time. So I'm gonna recommend that we look to schedule the next meeting in September. And what I'll do is I'll be coordinating with um, PCTV and the auditorium's booking schedule to find a date that works for, for everybody and I'll send out a meeting invite or meeting request as we have in the past. Um, and if anyone has any questions along the way, feel free to um, to reach out. Got one, so there's there's fencing around the barn right now Ooh, and that's gonna can have to be continued or something, so what's the schedule so, for that? Or um, we gotta that, commit to another six months? I don't, or? so Tim's gonna have the information maybe, or Eric, I know Eric I know Eric, does. Eric will have the information on that, but that's gonna continue as long as it's unsafe. Right, so, and there is a cost for that. And I, I'm afraid to say it out loud and be wrong, but I think it's in 
six month, inter three month yes. interval, six it's months, six. six month interval. So happy to provide that information at the next meeting if that's helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, there is a cost to it for sure. And so that's other, another thing the town board wants to you know, sort of being mindful of here. Um, anything else? That's a good question. Thank you. All right, so we're going to then, um, we will adjourn, adjourn, so fancy. I normally just say we'll end the meeting, but we'll adjourn the meeting um, uh, for the, the third uh, Clark Road Barn meeting. And um, I would say um, look for an upcoming meeting date in September. We'll make sure that that's out on the web as well. So anybody who's interested in tuning in at home. Sri, I hope uh, we haven't put you to sleep over there out in Zoom land. Oh, we, and we have. No. Oh, have oh, okay. <laughs> oh, that delay, Sri. I thought you had me worried for a second. Um, um, so thanks for joining us remotely. We appreciate it. And then um, if uh, we look forward to seeing you guys in, in a, about a month and a half. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank